Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much, Dean Young, for the well, warm welcome, and also to Dr. Kim, Sebastian Kim, Dr. Enoch Kim, um, Reverend Ha, for doing so much good work to organize us and invite us to this exciting symposium. And um, I'm really excited to have um, also Reverend, um, Reverend Dr. Song um, to you know, provide the response. Um, it was really great to speak with him about it. I'm truly indebted to Fuller's Korean Study Center because um, the work that so many of the scholars are doing associated with the Korean Study Center, um, I'm indebted to their work, and especially to Dr. Sebastian Kim and Dr. Kirsten Kim's work. I think, I think it's the first or second footnote of my new book is your is your book, the co-author book. <laughs> so it's 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 a, it's a very important source. Um, as someone who grew up in a Korean immigrant church and as the daughter of two Korean pastors, um, so much of the material we've covered already this week um, hits very, very close to home. And this morning for my lecture, we're going to take a trans-Pacific historical journey. So a journey into the past. We've talked a lot about the present, but today we're going to talk about the Korean War period. So mostly between 1950 to 1980. Um, in my new book, Race for Revival, How Cold War South Korea Shaped the American Evangelical Empire, I argue that Koreans were core to the making of modern evangelical America. And my book um, is now out on Kindle, um, but it comes out on hardback next week. So I'm very, thank you. Thank you, I appreciate that from the back. So I'm very excited for it. And um, what I will share draws a lot upon um, the work that I did for this book. So I show in this book, I show this argument that Koreans were core to the making of modern evangelical America through an oral history and archivally based investigation into three primary, primary evangelical parachurches that have deep trans-Pacific roots. So namely World Vision, the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, and then Campus Crusade for Christ. Did you know that we can trace the late 20th century global success of all three of these organizations, which are very influential even today, that you can trace their global success back to linkages forged with Koreans during and through the Korean War? That's the, that's the topic of my book. Consider, for example, Campus Crusade for Christ, which is why I highlight, highlight it here in the PowerPoint. Campus Crusade for Christ is a parachurch with roots hearkening back to Reverend Jun Gong Kim or Kim Jung Won Moksanim and Reverend Bill Bright's 1950s encounter here at the seminary, at Fuller Theological Seminary. When we discuss the past, present, and future of Korean, Korean immigrant, and Korean American churches more broadly, we cannot forget the trans Pacific networks that figures like Kim and Bright forged to revitalize American evangelicalism and South Korean Protestantism. So I bring Korean Protestants squarely into the center of a narrative that's traditionally thought of as very much an American story. Um, you really, when you, when you think about the field of American religious history, the history of American evangelicalism as, is at its very center. Um, in that story, mostly we're used to hearing it um, through the lens of figures like Billy Graham or Bill Bright, but I bring um, South Korea and South Korean Protestants to the very heart of that story. These networks led not only to the global reshaping of Campus Crusade and the mass recruitment of missionaries on both sides of the Pacific. That's why Korea was so important for Campus Crusade was its um, kind of missionary global expansion really depended on the partnerships they forged with Koreans. But also um, one of the biggest evangelical crusades in trans-Pacific history, Expo 74, 1974 in South Korea, um, was realized through these partnerships. So as you may recall, some of you may have been at Expo 74, actually. Probably you have, some of you, <laughs> okay. Yeah, so the very first day there were 1.3 million people gathered in Seoul for evangelistic revival and training. 
And this is this is truly one of the largest kind of evangelical crusades in the kind of trans-Pacific world that we can really mark. Um, and you might think about evangelical history as originating in the 18th century with so many transatlantic revivals, but in the 20th century, you really can't understand evangelicalism without this trans-Pacific frame. In peeling back this hit forgotten history, we also see the importance of the category of race. In the important role the Kim and Bright's Trans-Pacific networks played in shaping Cold War religion and politics. So that's also where um, I'm writing a religious history, but also really when we use a Trans-Pacific frame, uh, we're also very much bringing in the study of Cold War history, civil rights history, the history of race in America, all of that is coming in together. So I um, synthesize those stories together. So let's begin with the Korean War. The war triggered a new wave of Korean immigration to the US. To, so far, we have mostly been talking about the post-1965 Korean War immigration period, but I really want to today talk about the second wave of Korean immigration, 1950 to 1964. A period of Korean and Korean American history that we know we just have less documentation about. During this period, um, South Korean Protestants and white fundamentalists forged new trans-Pacific networks. Often called the, quote, post-Korean War immigration period, this moment brought not only Korean military brides and orphans, which actually we have more literature about that, about military brides and orphans, and less about the category of group that I'm going to talk about today, which is students. Especially men like Kim Jung-un Moksanim, Jung-un Kim, from Korea to the United States for their education. I also talk about um, the work that um, Kim Jung-un Moksanim did, and he was um, he was part of that second wave of Korean immigration. And he, you know, he's in the chapter two of this story. You can, I'm not going to talk about him today, but he's such a fascinating historical figure, and he's in chapter two of the book. Um, Chang An, or oh, so here's here's an image from Expo seventy four of Jung Gong Kim and Bill Bright. And I'm gonna come back to this image again. You'll see it at least two more times. Um, Chang An or Chuck is also a notable fictional figure from this time period. He's the male protagonist in Susan Choi's acclaimed novel, The Foreign Student. Has anybody read this novel before? It's kind of a lesser known novel, but it gives us also a window into Korean American immigration history in that lesser known period between 1950 to 1964. As an immigrant of the University of the South in Sewanee, Tennessee, he rooms notably with a son of a Klansman and falls in love with Catherine, a white Southern woman, all while battling the trauma of the Korean War. The novel really gives us a window into that, the trauma of war. And Chuck's fictional history parallels Jung Gong Kim's narrative of immigration and conversion as a student who inhabited, quote, racial interstitiality in a primarily black and white racial hierarchy, respectively in the 1950s Jim Crow South, which is the setting for um, Chang An's story um, in The Foreign Student, and then in Southern California, which is the primary setting for Jung Gong Kim's story as a historical figure. Jung Gong Kim's story remains distinct, however, as he highlights student immigration and conversion at 1950s white-led fundamentalist institutions, namely Fuller Theological Seminary and Campus Crusade for Christ. And I use the term fundamentalist as a historical category, right, in the way that U.S. historians like George Marsden would. If you take a look at his this very well-known book about the history of this very seminary, Reforming Fundamentalism, which I rely heavily upon, um, he notes that the term um, neo-evangelical or evangelical really doesn't come into popular kind of public parlance again um, until the late 1950s, right? And so still in the 1950s, we're using the term fundamentalist, right? The title of his book is Reforming Fundamentalism. For Jung Gong Kim, encountering Campus Crusade for Christ while he was a student immigrant at Fuller activated his faith as never before. I mean, Marsden is talking about the origins of Fuller, but he never talks about Reverend Jung Gong Kim. And in fact, um, we don't see any of the kind of Asian students, actually, who are a really big part of 1950s Fuller history. So we don't um, actually see them as central characters in this book, 
Uh, but in highlighting Kim's story, I want us to be able to see who else was there in the 1950s. Um, Jungo Kim was a student immigrant, and then he met Bill Bright, um, who was also a student at Fuller in the 1950s, who then went on to found Campus Crusade in 1951 at UCLA. And they both sought converts like the quarterback who later became Ronald Reagan's pastor at Bel Air Presbyterian Church. Like Bright, um, Kim also quit Fuller after one year and he returned to South Korea to launch Campus Crusade in 1958. He was their first non-white partner and he established the first international site for the organization. I think that's a really notable point of history, right? When you talk about the history of modern evangelical America, I just don't think you can really omit that piece of data. It was not as if Korean integration into Cold War American institutions was seamless, though. I mean, we have these stories of immigrants, um, but it wasn't a seamless process. The outbreak of the Korean War ignited suspicion of a communist overthrow from within the United States. As part of a national sweep of aliens suspected of subversive communist activity, two Korean men, David Hyun and Diamond Kim, were arrested for their respective engagement with labor activism and the publication of a pro-communist newspaper. Under the auspices of the 1950 McCarran Act, Koreans who questioned U.S. democracy's capacity to ensure freedom and equality for all were arrested and even deported. Yet if the U.S. government suppressed viewpoints like those of Hyun and Kim, other narratives like those of Jung Gong Kim's were highlighted. Okay, so in alignment with the Dwight D. Eisenhower administration's Cold War emphasis on U.S.-Asian integration, Kim's narrative bridged affective gaps between the United States and non-communist Asia through non-state institutions within fundamentalist America. A Cold War America favored these Korean narratives that intertwined a commitment to the Great Commission, world evangelization, with a particular form of racialized anti-communism. By the same token, white fundamentals, America's survival itself depended on the integration of non-white and non-communist Koreans. As my book shows, we couldn't have seen you know, the revival of fundamentalist America or the reformation of it without kind of non-white people's participation. Their lives uh, were central to the making and remaking of fundamentalist America. Fuller and Campus Crusade um, were institutions founded by white Protestants who emerged out of the fundamentalist strand of the fundamentalist modernist controversy. That's why I'm using that historical term, right? That period of history from the 1920s of the fundamentalist modernist controversy so central to the shaping of evangelical America later um, into the mid 20th and late 20th century. Um, these institutions are mostly targeted white students to fulfill their respective missions, but throughout the 1950s, they also prioritized the inclusion of students of Asian descent. And this is a story that I think we just don't hear enough about. They prioritized the inclusion of Asian descent, students of Asian descent more than any other non-white race largely reflecting the racial and foreign policy priorities of Cold War America. Kim's narrative of conversion into these institutions portrayed an image of racial equality in a liberal democracy, even as these institutions maintained a difficult system of racial inequality in which black students were by comparison relatively excluded and Koreans divided into good and bad racialized categories. Espousing these narratives of faith, however, did not mean Kim achieved equality within white fundamentalist America. His integration relied on Cold War Orientalist dynamics that actually subordinated him. So Kim's story required a polarization of Christian versus communist that exacerbated a divisive line between quote unquote good Koreans and then bad Koreans. As a racially interstitial student immigrant who was neither white nor black, Kim's story ultimately finds uneasy resolution. 
Through integration into white fundamentalist institutions, his narrative as a survivor of the Korean War was both celebrated, but also suppressed. By way of background, America's Cold War rise to global power was complicated, as nationalists throughout Asia were fighting for decolonization from Western domination. As Christina Klein notes here on the left, her book, Cold War Orientalism, the cultural pro problem became, quote, how can we define our nation as a non-imperial world power in the age of decolonization? One of the litmus tests for American democracy and by extension, the nation's legitimacy as a global leader in the Cold War era was its claim to racial equality. Projecting to the world that America championed racial equality was crucial for saving face on the Cold War stage, precisely because of the internationally publicized racialized violence against African Americans throughout the 1950s, which communist nations used against the United States. As Klein notes, an imagination of the U.S. as a racially diverse nation played a crucial role in the nation's Cold War expansion. Quote, the United States thus became the only Western nation that sought to legitimate its world ordering ambitions by championing, championing the idea, if not the practice, of racial equality. In contrast to European imperial powers, the captains of American expansion explicitly denounced the idea of essential differences in hierarchies. That's what made Cold War American expansion throughout the world distinct. America's relationship with non-communist Asians became a critical way to globally circulate an image of racial democracy. Eisenhower's administration encouraged everyday Americans to engage in people-to-people -people diplomacy that forged personal and intimate attachments with non-communist Asians through, quote, structures of feeling that sought, quote, sympathy, the ability to feel what another person feels. Klein's concept of Cold War Orientalism shows that such narratives, far from undermining the global assertion of U.S. power, often supported it. White fundamentalists closely aligned with Eisenhower's vision to establish heart-to-heart -heart connections with non-communist Asians, as they had long prioritized the heart's conversion to Christ through intimate kind of one-on-one -on -one encounters, a core means for fulfilling the Great Commission. And at mid 20th century, white fundamentalists insisted on the world's total evangelization in spite of the critiques of Western missionary imperialism and liberal denunciations of uh, kind of literalist interpretations of the Bible. And they were aided by Cold War America's military, economic, and political expansion throughout the world. Fuller and Campus Crusade were key institutional forces in that global effort. While these institutions were often thought of as local kind of domestic institutions, they were globally minded from their inception. It would be absolutely a mistake to think about Fuller or Campus Crusade as kind of mostly kind of locally or even domestically focused. They've always been globally minded. Fuller and Campus Crusade insisted on global expansion of the Christian mission. And this was also happening at a time where the U.S. also was expanding its territories, right? As much as missionaries went overseas to establish connections with non-Westerners, war abroad also triggered new immigration routes to the U.S. that created new networks. Koreans, in part, integrated into these networks through the second wave of Korean immigration from 1950 to 1964. In this second wave, limited immigration routes opened with about 15,000 Koreans immigrating to the United States. Again, this was the second wave that I talked about at the very beginning. Like largely through personal connections with US citizens, about 6,000 students immigrated from Korea during that second wave, much smaller than the period post 1965. The National Origins Act of 1924 barred Asian immigration to the United States and two High profile Supreme Court cases, the United States versus Thind and the United States versus Oza, rendered Asians as, quote, aliens ineligible for citizenship. In the 1950s, when the second wave of Korean immigration ensued with the onset of war, Asians in the United States lived under that precarious legal status. 
in an age of Asian exclusion. Yet throughout the 1950s, Cold War America cultivated Korean leaders, ambassadors of goodwill through specifically education. The State Department Leadership Grants Program, the Defense Department and private foundations sponsored education for thousands of Koreans and trained hundreds of Korean professionals, exposing them to American style modernity and capitalism. Most Korean international students during the 1950s would transfer their immigration status from non-immigrant to permanent resident, settling in the United States as professionals. Jung Gong Kim, however, returned to Korea, forging transnational networks, right, primarily through Fuller and Campus Crusade. In an age when Cold War America feared communist infiltration, his story of student immigration and conversion as a non-white and non-communist Korean gained trans-Pacific significance. Recall that this was also an era when racial segregation and Black exclusion haunted the American educational system. As for Fuller, the school, um, according to the Highgate um, yearbook, was founded by nearly an all-white faculty and white student body. As you may be aware, Fuller's starting class had approximately 32 men, and you can see them here on the slide. Nearly all white, with one man of Asian descent. In the 1950s, approximately 105 non-white students attended Fuller, of which approximately 93 students, 89%, were of Asian descent. In 1956, the first Black student attended Fuller, and thereafter, about five more attended throughout the decade. Approximately four Latino students attended in the 1950s, and of all the non-whites, about 10 were Asian women. Though Fuller did not practice strict racial segregation, as with the case of a school like Bob Jones, which I also talk about in my book, um, unfortunately, if you look at the early albums, the Confederate flag does make its way into some public school gatherings. As for Campus Crusade, the organization's founder, Bright, discouraged staff and student involvement in the civil rights movement, espousing a more individualistic and heart-centered approach to change, and belatedly created its Black student-centered campus ministry late into the 20th century. Yet, it forged its first non-white partnership with Kim, a Korean national, as early as 1958. As a racially interstitial student immigrant, Kim was incorporated into these trans-Pacific networks with white fundamentalists insofar as he also sought to fulfill the Great Commission and to acknowledge the U.S. as a racial democracy. The elements of his life that align more closely with the racial alienation of Black students and Black civil rights activists were suppressed. His narrative came at the cost of perpetuating a racialized anti-communist binary dividing Koreans into good and bad racial categories. Jung Kun Kim witnessed Korean communists from his village kill his wife and father, which led to a conversion more powerful than his initial Christian commitment. Quote, the starting point of my Christian life began when I faced persecution and death under the communist occupation. While enrolled at Chosun Seminary in Korea to become a Presbyterian pastor, he became disgruntled with Korea's growing theological liberalism. In 1957, he immigrated to Pasadena, California, right here where he attended Fuller and met Bright. Given that they came from markedly different backgrounds, how did they come to establish a partnership across the Pacific in the Cold War era? First, a, the a shared theological anxiety about modernism brought them together. Fundam the fundamentalist modernist controversy in the U.S. was not only a national theological dilemma, but also one that Christians elsewhere, including in Korea, shared. That Kim shared the critiques of modernism, communism, and liberalism with Bright and those of Fuller allowed him to extend the work of Campus Crusade internationally. And Kim's anti-communist conversion narrative in the midst of the Korean War cohered with Cold War concerns for the containment of communism, which distanced him from the, quote, red cause of North Korean communism, 
Relatedly, the, the racial implications of his conversion narrative set in a transnational context cohered with Cold War America's vision to integrate non-communist Koreans, which also distanced him from the, quote, red cause of civil rights. As for Bright, he had become a Christian at Hollywood's first Presbyterian church, a wealthy suburban church in the Sun Belt. At Hollywood Presbyterian, he met Henrietta Mears, the influential Christian educator under whose tutelage he experienced spiritual renewal. And you see him right here, um, just to the, all the way to the right, go back one, two, three. It's right there in that picture. Just one year after beginning his studies, however, Bright returned to California to revive his candy business, and that's when he, that's when Fuller was fortuitously founded and Bright transferred from Princeton to join the inaugural class. For Bright, quote, effective ministry equaled effective evangelism. And he did not think he necessarily had to remain in seminary to do that work. So he dropped out of, of, after one year and began Campus Crusade, um, the ministry at UCLA. The first chapter of hundreds Chungo Kim, on the other hand, matriculated at Fuller in 1957 in order to gain a stronger sense of, quote, intellectual Christianity. He was interested in studying Christian philosophy because he attributed his lack of evangelistic success among college students and youth to his inability to, quote, make the intellectual mind satisfied. Quote, liberal influences, he said, had brought, quote, great trouble to the Korean churches for the past 10 years chiefly through students who studied at liberal seminaries in the United States. Kim was referring especially to the theological tensions at Chosen Theological Seminary, where he initially enrolled in 1946. So U.S. theological institutions were experiencing fundamentalist modernist rifts, and the Korean theological landscape was also shifting along similar lines. That's why the transnational context matters so much, I think, for understanding this past. Chosun Theological Seminary, founded in 1940 by Korean theologians such as Kim Jae-jun, rejected biblical literalism and sought an alternative to Pyongyang Theological Seminary. In 1947, the same year Fuller was founded in Pasadena, 51 Chosun Seminary students, including Kim, signed a petition denouncing its theological liberalism. By July 1952, this fundamentalist cadre established the Korean chapter of the National Association of Evangelicals. Those following Kim Jae-jun's theological orientation created in 1959 a new Korean Presbyterian denomination, historically the most left-leaning in Korea. Though Kim had hopes in finding both a spiritual and an intellectual Christian tradition that would give him the key to evangelistic success and to remedying liberalism in the Korean church, he was also very skeptical about the American spiritual landscape. He wondered, was America a secular nation, or was it a Christian nation? Quote, frankly speaking, I had never expected to acquire spiritual power from this country. But when he arrived at Fuller, he entered a new center of spiritual revival, one that increasingly reformed itself into the new evangelicalism. So while at Fuller, Jungo Kim met Campus Crusade staff, he attended their meetings, he discovered the four, the precursors to the four spiritual laws, which was called God's plan for your life. And he, he declared this was a, quote, simple, basic message, and, quote, the key that God could use to open the hearts of men. He learned that instead of persuading a person philosophically, appealing to the person's mind through a basic, simple, evangelistic communication tool could chart a path to the heart's conversion. This was really core for Kim Jong-un. Kim wrote, I said to myself, here it is. This is the only key to winning the lost souls to Christ. So in 1958, he also left Fuller after one year and he internationalized Campus Crusade by establishing its first chapter in South Korea. Why don't we know this history? It's just, it's just not, you might know it from your own understanding of Korean theological history. Um, in the American context, how many immigrant churches or American theological institutions or American religious historians talk about this story? I mean, it's so core to the making of 
this night Cold War American past, but we rarely hear about it. While for Americans, anti-communism was rooted in a distant but lingering fear, Chung Gong Kim's anti-communism was rooted in a Korean in his Korean War experience, specifically of witnessing his family die at the hands of communists. Right for Kim Jong Un, um, communism was not about kind of a theoretical threat. Right, it was an actual, it was an actual threat. Right, so the ideological and theological battle that white fundamentalists and emerging neo-evangelicals fought in seminary classrooms in the U.S. and in suburban pul pulpits had an urgent life and death battleground on the stage of the Korean War, which made Kim's conversion narrative especially compelling. During Graham's, and you see this image of Graham in 1950, during, during Graham's and Harold Ockengay's Boston rallies in the 1950s, Communism served as a symbol of satanic and secular influence, and they feared communism not only as a threat to the evangelization of the world, but also as an apocalyptic sign of the end times. But still, it was very much kind of a, a distant threat. Moreover, intertwined with the Cold War anti-communist theology of this age was an argument against the, quote, red cause of civil rights. In the 1950s, white fundamentalists or emerging neo-evangelicals like Graham did not side with Martin Luther King Jr.'s cause for civil rights because of their individual-centered vision of sin and social change. Graham's conversion-focused theological paradigm, kind of focusing on the individual, eschewed institutional change. Graham argued King moved too fast and should put the brakes on racial reform in the 1950s. Anti-communism exacerbated white fundamentalists' individualistic theological resistance to civil rights reform. Unproven theories connecting Bolshevik radical activities to black activists' opposition to white supremacy into the 19, continued into the 1950s Red Scare when King's and other civil rights activists' vision for racial equality was cast as communist and therefore un-American or anti-American. When Graham preached about the communist threat in the 1950s, he linked the fear of communism with the, quote, fiery concern about the black civil rights activists who were, to their way of thinking, promoting communist ideas and socialism. He connected, quote, communism with civil rights work and fear of the end times and the Antichrist, which, quote, instilled fear and determination in evangelists and evangelical listeners alike. On the one hand, Cold War, the Cold War, as scholars have noted, like Mary Dudziak, Cold War propelled racial progress in America. As Cold War and civil rights historians have shown, international pressures to, quote, safeguard the nation's image overseas as a global leader against communism, in part, led to the desegregation of U U.S. military and education. On the other hand, racial progress stagnated anti-communist fear during the Cold War, and this is speaking especially to Carol Anderson's work in the middle. White fundamentalists like Graham played a key role in kind of thwarting that progress. Anti accusations that black civil rights activists were communists were not mere rhetoric, but fundamentally truncated their international human rights vision for racial equality. And that's a core part of Anderson's work. And she shows how it reduced their efforts to a more localized civil rights frame. Anti communism set limits on black civil rights activists' 1950s vision for peace building and decolonization in Asia. White fundamentalists and emerging neo-evangelicals further secured a racial wedge through anti-communist ideologies that created a false binary between Black freedom and Asian decolonization. At this time, as I mentioned, Koreans like Hyun and Kim arrested under the auspices of the McCarran Act who protested racial injustice in the United States were also cast as communists. The stigma of communism worked to, quote, discredit and make foreign Hyun and Kim struggle against racist practices in the United States. Their case, quote, importantly illustrated that anti-communist hysteria of the early Cold War years was entrenched in the fear of the foreign, and that's central to the work of Cindy Chang here on the right. 
Yet if Hyun and Kim's were narratives were represented of quote unquote bad Koreans, then Jung and Kim's narrative represented a narrative of a good Korean from the gaze of Cold War America. Though through Kim's narrative, white fundamentalists witness that the world's total evangelization was still possible, that America still had the potential to be a city on a hill. And yet such a narrative only further distanced Jung Kong Kim from the North Korean communists for whom he personally professed sincere love. Jung Kong Kim became core to the project of global evangelization as he extended non-state fundamentalist networks across US borders. And as I show in my book, really providing a lot of missional creativity to the work of globalizing Campus Crusade. Especially you see that through Expo 72, Expo 74, World Evangelization Crusade in 1980, his contributions were immense. Yet it came at a significant cost, especially as his narratives dis encouraged a disavowal of his own racial alienation, a legacy that would haunt Korean and Korean American Christianity. For by 1981, Jung Kong Kim continued to share with Bright his vision of Korea as the, quote, new emerging Christian kingdom. However, he now added the role of Korean America, for he started to observe a sea change in the United States, one that I think a lot of people talk about even today, but it was already happening in the 1980s. Whereas the, quote, U.S. churches held Sunday service at the coveted 11 a.m. hour and ethnic churches in the afternoon, they were now changing time slots, taking over prime time. Quote, Kim Jong-un says, quote, this is a sign that the Korean church is making the greater impact and needs to have an impact on the American church itself. The Lord gave us the idea that Korean citizens can be a great manpower source in the United States itself. Korean immigrant congregations in the United States had originally rented church spaces from U.S. churches, but he observed they were now outgrowing them. This is as early as 1981. And this is significant because 1974 Expo, Expo 72, the massive crusades throughout that time period were really making an influence. He visited L.A., San Jose, New York, and D.C., where he held Campus Crusade Leadership Training Institutes and Pastoral Seminars. In the aftermath of Expo 72, Expo 74, WEC 80, he saw hundreds attend his trainings and contended that this was a fruitful time for Korean American churches. Quote, we desire to have a second Puritan impact, spiritually speaking, in the United States. The first Puritans landed on the East Coast. The second Puritans will be from the ripe, alive Church of Korea, he declared. Channeling his excitement from the Trans-Pacific revivals of the 1970s and leading up to 1980, he announced Korean Americans would mimic South Korea's revivalistic explosion by leading Madison Square Garden into a Jesus 82 revival. Yet his excitement for Koreans to venture into their own errand into the wilderness as the quote, second Puritans was dampened with mourning the underside of that triumphant past. The quote, second and third generation he noticed are not well adjusted as Koreans living in America. He worried, quote, they are lonely and looking for reality. He continued, Quote, I have noticed that the majority of Koreans have struggled for identity and purpose in the U.S. for several years. I mean, it's so interesting that we're talking about identity and immigrant realities in Korean immigrant churches in 2022. And Jung Kong Kim was already talking about that in 1981, it's like 40 years later. But South Korean revivalistic success mismatched racialized immigrant realities. In Bright's response, he pra praised him as usual. He wrote, quote, my heart continues to sing praises to our Lord as you went from city to city. He was also eager to have Jung Kong Kim send 10,000 missionaries to Europe, the United States and other countries. But perhaps Bright had read the memo incorrectly for he cited 10,000 missionaries as opposed to the 100,000 that Jung Kong Kim had projected to send. 
He also made no mention in his correspondence of the struggles of the second and third generation that burdened Jungkook Kim. Campus Crusade, as an organization at the center of what I would argue in my book would become the center of the U.S. evangelical empire, was built by the hands and feet of Koreans. And its very global direction shaped by Cold War South Korea. Koreans, therefore, should have had a rightful place at the center of the organization. Okay, I really want to underscore that point. Jungkook and Kim have been working with the organization since 1958, when he met Bright at Fuller. And he became Campus Crusade's first non-white and international pa- partner. Yet Bright's lack of response mirrored Campus Crusade's historic misunderstanding of immigrant and non-white realities. Campus Crusade had invested heavily in overseas work, investing in saving people one by one for the sake of Jesus Christ. When it came to turning toward the social and structural needs of the least of these, including the role and needs of non-white staff and students in the U.S., it's as if that multicultural vision melted away. For his part, Chung Kun Kim had been masterful in passing down a Korean tradition centered on individual salvation and personal holiness. Some of you all here in this room and on Zoom may be personally affected by his ministry. But my question in looking at this past is what vision of social salvation and particularly social justice does he offer con- into this contemporary moment to South Korea and to contemporary Korean America? I think this is a question we really have to wrestle with. Because at Fuller, while he was at Fuller, he did primarily think about preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ through individual salvation for the sake of social transformation. He envisioned world evangelization as the primary route to national salvation for the Korean Peninsula. And as I talked about earlier, Um, many of those kind of transnational racial dynamics also continued to undermine the possibilities into the contemporary moment for Korean America. That is, Kim's religious vision had focused on the power of individual conversion, lacking a robust social vision that would also account for the limits of race and immigration that Korean immigrants would face and which would continue to undermine U.S. democracy. When the people of Kim's nation, those with whom Bright had so closely partnered across the Pacific, immigrated to Bright's home country, the limits of Kim jong un and Bright's synchronous network were readily revealed. Bright's and jung Kim's trans-Pacific network indeed flagged in the face of race and immigration. And as my book shows, South Korean Protestants had their own responses to the U.S. evangelical empire, and they even sought to supersede its global power. That also really has to be underscored. Yet even as their local agency was powerful, a core argument from the discourse of world Christianity, which I fundamentally draw upon in my work, I also note the structures of racialized power with which Korean Protestants contended and would continue to contend with, dampening that potential. As my book demonstrates, we cannot fully undo this past and its hauntings into the contemporary moment without the end of the Korean War, the end to the U.S. militarization of Korea, the unification of the Korean Peninsula. I'm a historian, not a prophet, but I believe the day that that happens, Koreans and Koreans throughout the diaspora will be more free to be all of who we are in Christ. Thank you so much. Yeah.